Michael Peterson Staircase Murder 12 Chilling Untold Facts University Bombing Netflix Affair The Owl Theory Today we go Behind the Crime Number 1 911 Call Performance Tom 911, where's your emergency? Kathleen Peterson was found dead at the bottom of the stairs in the North Carolina home she shared with her husband, the novelist Michael Peterson. Her wounds were brutal, and it looked as though Kathleen had been savagely attacked. There was a huge amount of blood, that it was inconceivable that this could happen from a fall down the stairs. There is more to this story. I am your host, Willow, and let's go behind the crime. What's wrong? My wife had an accident. She's still breathing. My wife, she had an accident, Peter Wales in a 911 call. She's still breathing. She fell, fell down the stairs. She fell down the stairs. She's still breathing. He's breathing when the call is laboured and breathy. The whole call almost sounds like a performance, a sinister cover-up. If he truly wanted to help his wife, he would engage with a 911 correspondent. But he doesn't. He starts the story. My wife fell down the stairs, creating an alibi. How many stairs did you fall down? Huh? How many stairs? stairs? How many stairs? Huh? Oh. Calm down, sir. Huh? Calm down. No, that was 15, 20, I don't know. Please, get somebody here right away. Please, okay, still somebody. He detaches himself from the call with, I don't know, what, what, what? I don't know, I don't know, what? He doesn't stay focused, as would be the case of the majority of people, and talk about the injured person, his wife, Kathleen. He doesn't sound like he is there with his wife in her final moments, as he can't answer the 911 correspondent's question with any clarity. How many steps did his wife fall down? What? What? What stairs? What? What? Biding himself some more time. Please, please, okay. please, 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 please. Peterson says please as a distraction seven times in 34 seconds. Please, 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 okay. please, 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 please. He never mentions the blood. Wouldn't this be one of the first things he would tell the 911 correspondent? Yet Peterson is more concerned with his get out of jail free card. My wife had an accident. She's still breathing. It's as though he wants to lock in on that fact that he couldn't be the killer. Listen. I'm not a murderer. My wife is still breathing. She is alive. And she fell down the stairs. My wife had an accident. She's still breathing. What? She fell down the stairs. She's still breathing. The authorities questioned Peterson's story that Kathleen had fallen while drunk and concluded instead that he had bludgeoned her to death, most likely with a blowpoke that was discovered missing from the house. Peterson was soon charged with murder. Number two. Netflix Affair Netflix series The Staircase chronicles Michael Peterson's trial. However, it is not an objective work, but rather, it's a first-person story from Peterson's point of view. One vital piece missing was Michael Peterson's long-term relationship with the French editor of The Staircase, Sophie Brunet. The director of the series put out a statement stating, but Sophie Brunet would never let her own feelings affect the course of editing. Of course, this seems dubious, as how can one simply say that their love affair did not affect the way they told the story? She is editing her lover's story. But will always win, therefore we can't rely on this documentary to give a true picture of Peterson. There was hundreds of unseen hours of footage, and this was whittled down to 13 episodes. What was cherry-picked would have been very much under Sophie's control. Peterson was part of the narrative, influencing it at every level. Brunet flew from Paris to North Carolina every two or three months over the course of four years to visit Peterson while he was in prison. And when Peterson was released, she moved in with him. This seems to be an unfair bias. Michael and Sophie parted ways after the Netflix documentary was released. Is this evidence of Michael having achieved his outcome of influencing the documentary? The prosecution was supposed to be more involved in the documentary, according to the staircase director, Jean-Xavier de Lettrade. 
The prosecution was initially supposed to be much more involved in filming. The plan was to showcase both sides of the trial evenly. However, after four months of shooting, the DA pulled the plug on the idea and refused to continue their involvement. After the prosecution pulled out of involvement in the Sear case, they then turned around and tried to demand the footage be turned over as evidence to be used in the trial. The only way to prevent this from happening was for the staircase filmmakers to join the defence team as attorney David Rudolph's employees. They also protected the footage by sending it back to France and thus the staircase team officially became Team Michael. Number 3. University Bombing The documentary refers to Peterson's oldest son Clayton getting in trouble in college but doesn't elaborate on the details that led to him spending four years in federal prison. Clayton had gone through turbulent teenage years in Germany, where easy access to alcohol and a fascination with explosives would later get him in trouble. He returned to Durham and sought to follow his father's footsteps to Duke University. At 19, Clayton was arrested and charged with planting a small bomb in a Duke University office. Clayton was convicted in federal court of possessing a destructive device after admitting in April 1994 that he broke into the Allen Building, which houses the Duke President and several other high administrative officers. He admitted to placing a pipe bomb submerged in gasoline in a closet on the second floor and to stealing photo identification equipment to make a fake ID. Clayton said in an interview from prison, that he planted a bomb to divert attention from the pursuit of a fake ID, which he had discussed with friends. This newspaper article was published in the Asheville Citizen Times, May 7, 1994. The heading read, Duke Freshman Charged in Firebombing Tent. A Duke University freshman had been charged with attempting to firebomb the university's main administration building 10 days ago and authorities said they found six more bombs in his father's home. As students prepared to pack up and leave for the summer, Clayton Sumner Peterson, 19, was at Durham Regional Hospital under police order to undergo a psychiatric evaluation. He faces charges of breaking into the Allen building and with possession of unregistered destructive devices. On Tuesday, ATF agents searched the house of Peterson's father. They found six more assembled explosive devices hidden in the attic along with a stock of chemicals and equipment that could be used to make more bombs. They also found a college ID camera and laminating machine that had been stolen from the registrar's closet the same day. Clayton Peterson's father, Michael Peterson, had no idea bomb, paraphernalia and stolen property was inside his home, officials said. On April 24, a university employee found an undetonated firebomb consisting of a gasoline-filled Gatorade jar armed with a pipe bomb detonator tucked in a closet in the registrar's office. A four-foot-long fuse had been lit but died out six inches before it reached the field. Number four, previous staircase death. Peterson was the last person to see another woman who was found dead at the bottom of a staircase in Germany in 1985. Her name was Elizabeth Ratliff. She was a recent widow. She hung out with Peterson every evening. Since her husband's death, Peterson would come over to visit her every evening after dinner. Peterson and friends maintained that their relationship was purely platonic. Often he'd help with the dishes or read to Ratliff's two daughters before returning home. She was found dead at the bottom of a staircase. First, her death was ruled to be an accident. After her death, German officials concluded that Ratliff had died of cerebral hemorrhage which led to her falling down the stairs. Just like with Peterson's wife, Kathleen, she suffered lacerations to the head, which were attributed to her fall. There was also a substantial amount of blood around the staircase. 
Witness Cheryl Appeal Schumacher testified during Peterson's 2003 trial that the blood reached all the way up the staircase. It took weeks for all the blood to be cleaned up. There was blood sprayed down the wall of the, where the staircase is. It's closed on one side and open on the other. And there was uh, blood on the wall coming down um, the side of the staircase. And there was blood on the wall opposite the foyer area. As Peterson was being investigated for the staircase death of his wife, Ratcliffe's body was exhumed in Texas. The North Carolina medical examiner performed an autopsy and concluded that she died from blunt force injuries result of a homicide. Is this just an unlucky man? A victim of circumstances? Or is this a cold-blooded killer? Number 5. Deleted Files Peterson had deleted 216 files from his computer the day before Kathleen's death. He also deleted 352 files two days following her death. The emails reportedly in part detailed Peterson's financial struggles, which could suggest motive if he did in fact kill his wife. Number six, extramarital affairs. Michael's lawyer in the documentary tells him that some man had come forward in relation to an affair. His voice is high and pitchy, and he fishes for information. Said you had sex with him. Oh, you're shitting me. Four or five times. Where? Uh, I don't know all the details, because I was skimming through all the stuff. And when I came to his... You're kidding me. Mm -mm. His respiration increases but he never denies the affair. In addition to contending that Kathleen discovered information about Peterson's bisexuality the night of her death, gay porn had also been found on his computer, as well as emails back and forth between Michael and a male sex worker named Brent Volgamot. The prosecution speculated that Kathleen's discovery of Michael's sexuality and his extramarital affairs led to a fight between them that resulted in her death. Number seven, money problems. Prosecutors also contended that Peterson killed his wife to gain control of her assets, including a 1.4 million insurance policy. Let's look at these money issues. Prosecutors presented experts and evidence that highlighted concerns about Kathleen's potential layoff at Northam, which she was the Director of Information of Services and made $145,000 a year. They also pointed to Nortel's decreasing stock value. Catherine Kaiser, I work for Nortel Networks. In the summer of 2001, because the stock price had risen so high, or had, it had gotten so high originally and then dropped so very low, most employees' stock options weren't worth any money anymore. And so employees were rather dissatisfied about that. Kathleen Peterson's sister testified that in mid-2001, Kathleen worried about losing her job and complained about tight finances that prevented the family from repairing their leaky plumbing and other issues within the house. Now in April 2001, the stock was becoming worthless, things were falling apart in the company, and she was very she was very specific that she didn't know by the end of the year if she would have a job there and she was going to have three kids in college. The fact that the girls, the, the monies they needed for clothes, for college, for books, um, one of the sons still was asking for money, and that was a concern to her, um, talking about the house. They had a bat colony in her house because the roof wasn't right. What it cost to get of a bat colony. She talked about termite damage in the living room. A, a normal house, anything might cost a couple hundred dollars to fix. In a mansion, it's always several thousand dollars to fix anything. Michael Peterson, in an email to a family friend, six days before Kathleen's death, wrote, Poor Kathleen is under the tortures of the damned at Norton. They've laid off 45,000 people, he wrote. She's a survivor and in no trouble, but the stress is monumental here. Prosecutors showed that the Petersons had more than $143,000 in credit card debt 
in late 2001 and more money going out of their bank accounts than coming in. Some of Peterson's emails revealed that in the months before his wife's death, he sought financial help for his children. On November 29, 2001, Peterson wrote to his ex-wife Patricia, urging her to take out a $30,000 home equity loan to pay credit card debt incurred by, her, by their two sons, Clayton and Todd. The young men owed $1,000 a month in interest alone. Peterson ended the message by saying, it is simply not possible for me to discuss this with Kathleen. Peterson stood to gain 1.4 million if the death was ruled an accident. The money ultimately went to Kathleen's biological daughter and to Kathleen's first husband. Peterson received $384,000 in death benefits, which he spent on legal fees. Number eight, Michael the Liar. It is safe to say that Michael Peterson was a successful novelist, as well as a newspaper columnist, but he unsuccessfully ran for mayor in 1999 and then city council in 2001, a month before Kathleen was found dead. For years, Peterson had claimed a severe war injury to his right leg. He had also said he had received two Purple Hearts in Vietnam. This was not the truth. Peterson had acquired the injury in a car accident. At the time, the News and Observer took a closer look as well at these claims. Marine Corps' files showed no record of Peterson receiving a Purple Heart Medal, which is given to soldiers injured or killed in combat. There is a major difference in the account given by Michael in the Netflix documentary compared to the interview with Dr. Phil eight years later. Peterson said in the Netflix staircase episode one that on the night of Kathleen's death, they watched a film and walked out to the garden before going to bed. On Dr. Phil, he said that Kathleen received a call from her employer about a teleconference in the morning, a fact that was previously absent. Uh, that night, uh, December the 9th, Kathleen and I were watching TV. And about 10 o'clock, I guess it was, 11 o'clock, my son Todd and her girlfriend came over and they talked, and we, they were all going off to a party, and they left, and then we went into the kitchen, and the answering machine was blinking. And so I picked it up, uh, and it was for Kathleen. Call Canada immediately. She worked for Nortel, which was a Canadian firm. And so she called Canada, who told her, oh, you have a teleconference in the morning, which was a total surprise to Kathleen. And then she hung up, and she did not now want to go, to go to bed. So we got the rest of the wine, we went out to the pool, and we talked. And again, one of those things, what do you talk about when your wife's going to die in a couple of minutes? Well, I didn't know she was going to die, so I'm sure we just talked about Christmas was coming up, what were we, what were we going to get the kids, things like that. And then she said to me, uh, well, I got to go to bed, I'm going to go upstairs for the teleconference in the morning. And uh, I said, okay, good night, dear. Uh, and that was the last I saw her, really, alive, vibrant, was walking from the pool towards the house. Peterson and his attorneys mentioned alcohol as a factor in the fall multiple times throughout the staircase. But she wasn't as intoxicated as some of the comments would suggest. Her blood alcohol levels was reportedly low enough to pass a breathalyzer test. In the 2004 book, A Perfect Husband, it revealed that red neurons were found in Kathleen's brain. Apparently, red neurons develop in the brain when it lacks oxygen over a long period of time, suggesting Kathleen's death was prolonged and not quick. In fact, expert Dr. Hian Lisma testified that Kathleen had suffered severe blood loss at least 45 minutes before she stopped breathing. This contradicts Peterson's timeline of events, in which he initially said he went to turn off the pool lights and then headed inside, where he discovered Kathleen at the bottom of the stairs. In Peterson's first 911 call, Kathleen was still breathing. 15 minutes later, in his second call, she had apparently stopped breathing. Where are they? Please, please, would you hurry up? 
When the emergency medical team arrived shortly after, the blood was so dry that they didn't need to wear protective clothing. How is this possible? Kathleen had just died. Number 9. The Owl Theory A bizarre theory that an owl attack was ultimately responsible for Kathleen's death was first put forward by the Petersons next door neighbour, a lawyer called Larry Pollard. The theory is loosely based around the fact that during an autopsy, a microscopic feather was found in Kathleen's skull. However, experts state that this could have easily come from a down-stuffed pillow. The other fact that gave fuel to this theory was the trident-shaped lacerations that seemed to resemble the pattern of an owl's talons. However, expert orthologists said that while owls can sometimes attack, they could only ever graze their victims. In fact, following a worldwide search, there has not been a single reported case of an owl doing enough damage as to kill a person. The chances of this happening are the same as the chances of you winning a lottery twice without even entering. I know it's much more plausible that an owl kill Kathleen than I did, and that's all I can that's as far as I can go. Number ten Son Todd's behavior. On the night of Kathleen's death, Peterson's son, Todd, arrived back to the house with four friends having come from a party. Police testified that Todd was uncooperative that night. Todd had been asked not to talk to anyone, yet he continued to do so. The police had to come to separate Todd from other women, and an officer caught Todd trying to signal to other people through a window at the crime scene. Todd went on to set up a website which offered inappropriate tips to school-aged children. Todd said the website was to provide advice to teens, yet much of the content and photos of scantily dressed girls was inappropriate for that age. It featured articles like, Is marijuana really so bad for me? and Dealing with drunk friends. It also had a section devoted to hotties for people who were feeling voyeuristic. Number 11. Rudolph's Wife Defence lawyer David Rudolph's wife, Sonia Pfeiffer, was a reporter on Peterson's trial while working for a news agency. Pfeiffer was caught sending a letter to jurors during deliberations, inviting them to have dinner with her and partake in interviews. Kathleen's sister accused Pfeiffer of misconduct during the trial in her victim impact statement, saying that she had pretended to be her friend and manipulated her into getting an exclusive interview. This portion of Kathleen's sister's victim impact statement was edited out of the Netflix documentary. Number 12. Michael's Type of Woman There is a striking similarity between Kathleen, Elizabeth Ratcliffe and Netflix editor Sophie Brunet. One might wonder, does Michael Peterson have a type of woman? Michael and his ex-wife Patricia moved back in together during Patricia's final years. They lived in an apartment with no staircase. You've heard the facts. Now what do you think? Leave me a message below. And whether you think Michael Peterson is innocent or a cold-blooded killer. If you would like some more Behind the Crime, like and subscribe. I'm your host, Willow. Thank you for joining me on Behind the Crime.